everybody in the movie has his own reason for doing what he's doing. Even the person who steals the, the truck. But there are cops in it, there are uh, ICE agents in it, and each one of them um, has his or her own reason uh, and his or her own life to, to lead. And so what we set out to make was a story that wasn't symbolic in its logic, but that was as simple as possible in conveying how people might act. And we, we you know, help, what helped in the writing process a great deal was to check in with the people who were actually doing what, we, what the characters were doing. That is to say, we, we met with uh, illegal immigrants, we went to an ICE um, detention center, uh, we uh, spent a lot of time with Father Gregory Boyle and the people at Homeboy Industries so that, you know, uh, we, we met with uh, ex-gang members and with uh, young kids from East LA. Uh, each one of them has things to say uh, about their lives. And the further you go towards specificity with the character, the less likely you are to get hammered for, you know, for being symbolic in the way that you're presenting things, and the less it seems like you're on a soapbox. The, the people who came out to watch the Twilight movies are really in favor of movies that are about uh, people and their emotions. Things don't have to blow up, and uh, they don't have to be superheroes, they don't have to be giant robots. Um, so uh, I think in a way they're the hope for the future, for people to make films about people and their emotions. And this that's exactly what this movie is about. Um, and I had the, um, had the opportunity to show uh, A Better Life to 10 of the, um, the the uh, heads of the top Twilight websites, uh, we had a special screening for them, um, and they loved it. Uh, and uh, and so I I do, I still maintain that the imaginary character of Bella Swan would go and see this film. Uh, it's it's now going to be called Welcome to Suck City. Uh, it's based on the memoir Another Bullshit Night in Suck City, and uh, I couldn't get away with the bullshit part. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, after much uh, back and forth, uh, got the Suck City part in the title. Um, it's based on this really beautiful memoir uh, by, this, by a poet named Nick Flynn, who when he was in his 20s uh, worked at a homeless shelter and uh, he, he didn't know his father growing up, uh, hadn't seen his father in 18 years, and his father was an alcoholic who ended up living on the street and living in the shelter that, that Nick was working in. And so they uh, began a very unconventional uh, relationship and um, uh, became part of each other's lives in that weird circumstance. Um, it's also a movie about writing because uh, Nick's father, Jonathan Flynn, uh, considered himself one of the three great writers that America has produced. Uh, <laughs> Mark Twain, J.D. Salinger, <laughs> and, and himself, Jonathan Flynn. Um, and he was always working on this great novel. Uh, uh, called uh, the Button Man, <laughs> and um, but he would work on it on napkins, on whatever scrap of paper he would have, and also he filled these manuscripts with it, but never finished it. Um, and uh, but imbued his son with this uh, idea of being a writer, and then Nick ended up um, uh, becoming a very uh, lauded poet and writing this memoir, another bullshit night in Suck City, about his father. So there's all sorts of aspects of um, that bonded me to the story um, uh, of how ego relates to, to creativity um, and how sort of ego can destroy you um, uh, and sort of the, the aspect of writing which is simply the task of like sitting down every day and doing it and that being sort of the core thing that makes you a writer as opposed to um, uh, people who might be a really good storyteller and, but who are never sort of able to, to show people their stuff or to complete something. After the talkies came in, uh, my grandmother's uh, Mexican accent became a liability <laughs> um, in terms of doing uh, uh, all but a certain kind of role. And um, uh, she was going to leave Los Angeles. And my grandfather, who was a producer, um, had fallen in love with her, and they weren't married yet or anything. And he came your up with yeah, my grandfather, who, was, who at the time was a producer named Paul Conner, uh, he later became an agent. Um, and he came up with the idea of doing uh, Spanish language versions of. Um, English language films they were shooting on the lots. So, and in the case of Dracula, 
the American cast would do the Todd Browning version, and then at night the Latin actors <laughs> would come in and do a sexier um, <laughs> and uh, more <laughs> uh, darker version of the more film. More macho. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and my, our, our, yeah, our grandma played Lucy, um, Dracula's paramour. Our mom, uh, uh, Susan Conner, when she was Susan Conner, uh, was nominated for, uh, she, she actually, she played a, um, a, a, someone passing as white, a girl passing as white in Imitation of Life, the Douglas Sirk movie. And she was also in John Huston's um, biopic of Freud, which had an original scenario by Jean-Paul Sartre. Didn't quite make <laughs> the final cut, I think. Uh, it was much more condensed. Um, but yeah, our, our, our mom was an actress. Well, it, it's interesting, actually, listening to Paul talk about um, uh, about Suck City, because our, you know our father was des a designer, but he had also served in World War II um, in the OSS, which was the precursor to the CIA. He had a tremendous amount of knowledge about the Nazi hierarchy, and so he wrote uh, biographies of prominent Nazis. And I think that really if you'd asked him what he wanted to do in his life, it would have been to be a writer. And what he would rather be remembered for would be as, as a writer. And I, I think both my father and my brother share the ability to sit in a room and write for long periods of time. Whereas I, I've always been a bit more of a dilettante and I tend to make myself lots of cups of coffee, <laughs> go out and eat, and do almost anything. I mean, I, we, I think we're probably on the, on the far ends of the spectrum in terms of writerly discipline, yeah. so I can sympathize with those who find it difficult to write. Uh, yeah, I have an inversion of the norm, which is that um, I avoid my discomfort in life by writing. Most people avoid their discomfort in writing by, by procrastinating. <laughs> books were really important. We grew up around a lot of books. Um, our, our grandfather was a, a Biblio Maine. Uh, our our mom and dad read all the time, and, and our mom read to us. Uh, there's that, and there's also uh, I think imbued by our grandparents a respect for old Hollywood and for classic films and for foreign films because our fa our grandfather eventually became an Asian and he represented some really extraordinary uh, people: Ingmar Bergman, Billy Wilder. Um, Max von Sydow. So, uh, w you know, one thing that I think has been a strength for us, which which doesn't mean that other people can't acquire it willingly, is that we um, we're aware of and very respectful of um, classic films. And nowadays, you can go on Netflix, or if you live in a reasonable sized city, you can go to a revival house and see these movies. Um, and I think that's been a t tremendous advantage to us to be aware of those things. I think you learn different things at different times. Um, and I, I can remember uh, my grandfather was, our, our grandfather was the agent for various times, um, Billy Wilder and William Wyler and um, John Houston for a very long period of time. But I remember him telling a couple of stories about going to uh, research screenings with uh, Wilder and, and Wyler. And you know how people <laughs> were ragging on the movies, <laughs> and um, I, I think there's a tendency to think that the people who come before you have just a marvelous sort of easy, easy road, and it, it is comforting sometimes to to think of sort of great filmmakers and, and writers uh, who were really struggling at various points. Um, uh, I, I think that I mean there's a weird the, the the I suppose great but also disturbing thing about uh, writing for film is it's the place at which the, the ends of the spectrum are the most disparate. Um, you are oftentimes generating something by sitting alone in a room, which is a marvelous place to be. <laughs> um, and then uh, it ends up being something that, if you're in the studio system, uh, is becomes a, a mass market thing, which is meant to be seen by a huge number of people. On some level, you always need to keep in contact with, with the piece itself. Um, there, there's something that you're trying to preserve, which is sort of, to me, it's it's the the point at which the piece is making itself, whether it be in the writing phase or in the directing phase, certainly in the writing phase. Um, uh, and there's all sorts of things that buffet you and, and can make you feel artificial and like a zombie as opposed to a living, creative person. Yeah, you got to be really careful about writing something with um, 
a film audience looking over your shoulder. Yeah, or success of any sort, really. Yeah, I mean, to, to that degree, I mean, I think that, that after now uh, that I've been doing it for 20 years, I've just begun to be able to think, okay, well, I understand that this is this sort of comedy that I'm writing for this kind of audience, and I can sort of keep at bay the notion that somewhere down the line, somebody in some test screening is going to complain about this joke, so I'm not going to write it. I can still do what I'm supposed to do and maintain the integrity of what I'm supposed to be writing. Mm -hmm.